Hello everybody and welcome to the chapter 14 lecture on DNA structure and function. This is an especially important chapter because this is the chapter where we actually get into the structure of this molecule we've been talking about for a long time called DNA. DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid, as you know by this point, is the molecule that composes your genes and chromosomes, which are the basic hereditary molecules of all living organisms. The structure of the DNA is what encodes the different traits and characteristics that each individual organism possesses, and therefore knowledge of the structure of DNA is very important because the structure is give what gives rise to the actual traits. Now, it may surprise you to know that the structure of DNA was actually discovered nearly 70 years ago in 1953 by a collection of people, uh, Watson, Crick, Franklin, and Wilkins. And this discovery has ended up being one of the greatest discoveries of all time. And this is because it has, an it has enabled so many different technologies and solutions to come in the world of science and medicine that were not possible before DNA structure was realized. Because we know the structure of DNA, we are now able to understand the genetic basis for diseases that are passed down or caused by mutations. For example, sickle cell anemia is a disease that we talked about in our last lecture, which is caused by a single mutation in the gene for making the protein hemoglobin, which is responsible for carrying oxygen to all of the tissues of your body, and it resides inside of red blood cells. We know this because we understand the structure of DNA and we understand that changing the structure of this particular part of your DNA can result in a mutation that sickles the shape of the red blood cells. This is just one example of a genetically caused disease that we understand now because we understand the structure of DNA. On that same note, because we understand the structure of DNA, we are also able to develop ways to correct the problems that we know exist in some people's genetics that can cause diseases. For example, at the very beginning of class, we talked about how the FDA had approved the first ever gene therapy uh, used for pediatric leukemia, which involves actually taking cells out of the body and training immune system cells to fight this particular form of cancer by genetically engineering them and putting them back into the body so that they can do their job. And it's a highly effective form of treatment. But it is only made possible by understanding the structure of those immune system cells' DNA and how we need to change that structure in order to make them better able to fight the cancer. With our knowledge of DNA, we are also capable of cloning organisms. The sheep that you see on the slide here is called Dolly the Sheep, and she was the first ever mammal to be cloned back in 1996. And today, animals are routinely cloned as a part of pharmaceutical and medical testing because although uh, it's not nice to think about, all of the drugs and, and uh, the medicines that we take on an everyday basis they had to be tested on animal models before they were ever introduced to humans. That's just part of the process. To make sure that they're safe for humans, they first test them on animals. And in particular, they test them on rats and pigs. These are two very common animals that, that drugs are tested on. And in order to make sure that the majority of variables are all controlled and kept consistent, Large amounts of genetically identical clones of these animals are produced, and these, these, uh, these gatherings of clones are what the drugs are actually tested upon. So it's an important concept for our pharmaceutical testing. And then finally, with our knowledge of DNA, we can understand evolutionary and familial relationships just like you can look at the DNA of a child and determine who that child's parent is based upon their DNA, you can also determine uh, evolutionary relationships by comparing different species and determining what species are most closely related or what could be the evolutionary ancestor of uh, such and such species. This works on the species level as well as with individual organisms. Even now today, our understanding of DNA is enabling new technologies, 
And those technologies allow us to actually change the content of some living organisms' genes by genetically engineering them. And believe it or not, this is even happening in humans. The headline right here, uh, which says, a year in, the first patient to get gene editing for sickle cell disease is thriving. This is an example of this kind of genetic engineering, which is actually being carried out on humans. This lady, who has sickle cell disease, had her red blood cells genetically engineered to correct the mutation which causes the disease and then placed back into her body. And at this point, it appears to be working really, really well. So again, this is just one example that would not be possible unless we understood the structure and function of DNA, which is what this chapter is all about. So now that I hopefully have convinced you that this is an important chapter for understanding all of these different phenomena, let's get down to the details of the structure and function of DNA. Part of this will be review, such as this slide, which tells us that there are four different nitrogenous bases within the nucleotides that compose DNA. And those are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine, which are respectively indicated with the variables A, G, C, and T. Within these four different nitrogenous bases, there are actually two different groups. The nitrogenous bases that only have uh, one ring are classified as pyrimidines, whereas the ones that have two rings are classified as purines. So adenine and guanine are considered a purine, and cytosine and thymine are considered a pyrimidine. The other components of the DNA nucleotide are the phosphate group and the sugar. And while the nitrogenous base can vary between A, T, G, and C, the phosphate group and the sugar are always the same, because phosphate groups are phosphate groups, nothing can change about those, and the sugar found in DNA is always deoxyribose, which is the namesake of the molecule. So here's what the four different DNA nucleotides look like, each of which has an identical phosphate group and an identical sugar, the only thing that changes between them is their nitrogenous base. Each of these is just a single building block of a larger DNA strand. And we saw earlier in the semester that the way that these molecules are put together is through something called a dehydration reaction, where a hydrogen and an oxygen and hydrogen from two separate building blocks get together, form a water molecule that leaves, and in their place, there is a new bond that is formed linking the two building blocks, which is actually called a phosphodiester linkage or a phosphodiester bond. So the bond between the two different building blocks is called a phosphodiester bond. So knowing this, let's go ahead and see how a strand of DNA can be destructed or constructed from individual nucleotides. Here we're looking at one nucleotide. We've got a phosphate group, the deoxyribose sugar, shown as this green hexagon, and then we have the nitrogenous base, which in this case is adenine, shown with A. If we add a second nucleotide to make a small chain here, we have linked the two with a phosphodiester bond, and this particular nucleotide has the nitrogenous base C corresponding to cytosine. We keep doing this over and over, and eventually we get something that looks like a strand of DNA. Now together, the sugar and the phosphate groups, which as you can see, alternate down the left-hand side of this strand, those are considered the backbone of the DNA molecule. So the backbone is this alternating chain of phosphates and sugars. The role that the nitrogenous bases play is not in holding the nucleotides together, like the phosphates and sugars do, but rather the nitrogenous bases hold this one strand to its complementary strand. Hydrogen bonds are connecting the two strands between the nitrogenous bases. And the two strands are called complementary strands because the sequence of one strand predicts the sequence of the other strand in that only certain nitrogenous bases will associate with other nitrogenous bases. From here, we can see specifically that guanines are always across from cytosines and vice versa. 
we can also see that adenines are only attracted to thymines and vice versa. We can also see that between these two different pairs, the G's with the C's and the A's with the T's, there are different numbers of connections or hydrogen bonds between the two. Thymine and adenine are always linked by two hydrogen bonds, whereas guanine and cytosine are always linked by three hydrogen bonds. Therefore, the connection or the attraction between the guanine on one strand and the cytosine on another strand is actually slightly stronger than the connection between the thymine on one strand and the adenine on another strand because there are three hydrogen bonds connecting them instead of two. Now, this depiction of DNA that you see on the left is really nice because you can look at all of the individual components, you can look at the bonds, and you can see very clearly what's going on in this molecule of DNA. And as we move forward in the lecture, we are going to depict the DNA molecule more like this, but it's important to know that in living cells, the DNA does not sit nice and flat in this ladder-like structure that we see right here. Instead, it winds around itself into this structure that you see on the right that is called a double helix. But because in the double helix it's much more difficult to see what's going on with all of the different pieces of the structure, we are going to stick to depicting the DNA in the form that you see on the left hand side. The two complementary strands of DNA run in opposite directions compared to each other. And what that means is that if one strand starts with a phosphate group and ends with a sugar, the opposite strand will start with a sugar and end with a phosphate group. It is only in this orientation that the two strands are able to line up in such a way that they are able to create these hydrogen bonds which connect their nitrogenous bases. If they ran in the same direction, then those hydrogen bonds would not be able to properly line up so that the complementary strands come together. We have specific terms or uh, variables that are used to designate the two different ends of a DNA strand, which are going to come in handy in just a few slides from now when we start talking about the process of DNA replication. The end of a DNA strand that has a phosphate group located there is called the 5' prime end, whereas the end that has a sugar located there is called the 3' prime end. So in this molecule of DNA, we have a 5' prime end at the top in the left-hand strand, as well as a 5' prime end at the bottom of the right-hand strand. We have a 3' prime end where you see the two sugars, at the bottom of the left-hand strand and at the top of the right-hand strand. So for the rest of this lecture, what we are going to be doing is focusing on discussing how cells make their own DNA. Because we know that cells have to do this every single time they divide. The average cell divides approximately 50 to 70 times before its death, and every single time it goes through a division, it has to make a complete copy of its genes, which will be given to one of the two new daughter cells that come out of the division. Remember that this takes place during S phase of the cell cycle, which we mentioned before and said that this is when the DNA is made, but we did not describe how it was made, and that's what we're going to talk about now. Overall, this process is referred to as DNA replication. DNA replication involves a series of enzymes that carry out chemical reactions on an existing double-stranded piece of DNA. The method is actually kind of elegant because it uses an existing DNA molecule as the template from which the new strand is constructed. So these enzymes will come in, they will read the DNA molecule sequence in the old strand, and then from that sequence they will use it to build a new strand to match the old strand, effectively doubling the amount of DNA by the time the process is finished. So we're going to walk through the steps one by one that are involved in this process, starting with the first step, 
wherein an enzyme called helicase binds to the old piece of DNA at a site called the origin of replication, and helicase will then separate the two DNA strands at that location. Now, just to give you some clues here, anything that ends in ASE or A's is an enzyme. And then the other part of the name often gives you a sense of what that enzyme does. So helicase is named for the fact that it separates this double helix structure. Helicase comes from helix. This is a necessary first step because when the DNA molecule is zipped up tight like this, the other enzymes cannot access the nitrogenous bases here, and therefore they cannot read what is going on on each of these two strands. They can't tell what letters are here. And so helicase has to separate the two strands in order for the sequence of letters, the A's, T's, G's, and C's, to be readable for the other enzymes. In our first checkpoint here, I want you to tell me what type of bonds are being broken during this first step. Okay, so let's get back to this DNA molecule. Helicase has bound to the origin of replication, and then it moves through the DNA and it separates the two strands moving in this direction here. After it does some separating action, then in order to keep the two strands separated from each other, special binding proteins come on the scene and attach to each of the single strands to prevent them from zipping right back up with each other. This is necessary because remember, these two strands are complementary, and the sequence of letters on this strand is highly attracted to the sequence of letters on this strand. Therefore, to prevent those attractions from simply causing the uh, helicase's work to be undone, the binding proteins keep the two strands separate from each other. So, so far, we have opened up the DNA molecule, and we have secured the two strands to keep them apart. What would make sense to happen next is for another enzyme to come in and start reading the sequence of letters and building a new strand based upon those letters there. However, there's a problem. And that problem is that the enzyme that makes the DNA does not actually know where to start reading. And so there's an intervening step that has to come first where a little molecule is created which will teach the DNA making enzyme where to start making DNA. So this step involves another enzyme called primase entering the scene. And primase will actually create a short piece, not of DNA, but of DNA's cousin, RNA, called a primer on each of the DNA template strands. It's called a primer because it primes the DNA to be made. It readies the DNA to be prepared. So we have a primase enzyme here on each strand, and those primase enzymes are going to create the new piece of RNA. Here's another kicker. All of these enzymes that are involved in DNA replication are going to read the DNA template in a specific direction and write their new strand in the opposite direction. If you see on this diagram here, we have the 5' prime and the 3' prime ends denoted, and we can see that the strands run in opposite directions to each other, just like we learned. We've got the sugar end, the 3' prime over here, and if we follow that strand down, we have the phosphate expected with the 5' prime end. And then on the opposite strand, it runs in the opposite direction, with the sugar end directly opposite of the phosphate. We follow that strand down to the other side, and we see the phosphate end. Now, I'll remind you that the rule is that the enzymes involved in this process read the DNA starting at the 3' prime end and moving towards the 5' prime end, and they write their new strand 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So what that means is that because these strands are oriented in opposite directions, the enzymes are going to be moving in opposite directions along them.
So let's see what this looks like. The primase at the top, which is moving from 3 prime to 5 prime and therefore from right to left, will move in this manner. And as it does so, it will create a short little piece of RNA depicted in green, which is called the primer. Remember that the purpose of the primer is to show where the DNA making enzyme should start. On the bottom strand, which runs in the opposite direction, we are going to see the RNA primase enzyme go from left to right. And as it does so, it will create this little primer called an RNA primer. And since we're spending so much time talking about RNA, we might as well do a checkpoint at this point to review what the structural differences are between DNA and RNA nucleotides, which is something that we went over way back in our first unit, but it's important now again to review this. So tell me, what are the differences between DNA and RNA nucleotides? Okay, so getting back to the primase. The primase has created this little piece of RNA, the purpose of which is to figure out for the DNA enzyme where it needs to start. So now the DNA enzyme can come on the scene, and the DNA enzyme is called DNA polymerase 3. There are other DNA poly polymerase enzymes called DNA polymerase 1 and DNA polymerase 2. But again, these enzymes were named in the order in which they were discovered, not in the order in which they are relevant to the process. And so the first DNA polymerase that pops up in this process is 3. Later on, we're going to see DNA polymerase 1, and we're not going to see DNA polymerase 2 at all because that's involved in something else. So that's another little annoying detail that you have to navigate. So DNA polymerase 3 will find the existing primer and it will extend the primer by attaching more nucleotides to it. And this time it's not making RNA, instead it's making DNA nucleotides. Again, these enzymes are going to move in accordance with the, the directionality of the strand that they are working on. So this top strand runs from three on the right to five on the left. Therefore, the DNA polymerase on the top strand will move from right to left, and it will build the DNA strand with the complementary letters on the opposite side. Down here, because the DNA polymerase is going in the opposite direction, it will move from left to right and build the DNA strand in accordance with the sequence of letters on the template strand. DNA polymerase 3 also has this cool ability to proofread its own work, and so after it lays down the new nucleotides, it will proofread and replace any correct nitrogenous bases that it has added to the sequence that was just built. So knowing what you know about the patterns of which letters correspond to uh, which letters on the opposite strand. If one of the template strands reads this sequence, ACC, TG, TTA, what will DNA polymerase 3 lay down as the sequence of letters on the opposite strand? Remember, it's not just going to make the same thing, it's going to make the complementary strand that matches up and hydrogen bonds with this particular sequence. So what will be the complementary sequence of letters? Now, while all this is happening, this enzyme helicase, which we saw in the very first step, is still working to further unzip the double helix of the DNA. As it does this, it exposes more DNA here, which can then be copied. On the DNA strand at the top, which started with the 3' prime end, the DNA polymerase 3 enzyme is able to synthesize the new DNA continuously and just keep on trucking because it is going in the same direction as the helicase. So as helicase exposes more letters as it unzips the DNA, this guy can just follow behind helicase and make the DNA accordingly. So let's see that happen. 
On the other strand, however, we have a little bit of a problem. The strand that begins with the five prime end has an issue because this polymerase has made it all the way to the end of this strand here, right? And so it will make until it can't make any more DNA. But after that, something else has to happen because all of these newly exposed DNA bases, these are now behind the direction of the DNA polymerase. And so the process literally has to start over. Once again, primase has to come on the scene. It has to go as close as it can to the replication fork here, where the two strands are being peeled apart. And it will build the new primer, showing DNA polymerase where to start again. And then after primase is finished, DNA polymerase 3 will once again find the end of the primer and moving again in the same direction, it will make another little fragment of DNA and proofread its work. So now the DNA that we have looks like this. Again, helicase is going to unwind even more of this DNA strand. And as it does so, the DNA polymerase 3 on the top strand can just continue to move in the same direction as the helicase and build out the top DNA molecule. But on the bottom strand, we have the same problem because with the second fragment, DNA polymerase bumps into the first fragment. And to get at these exposed bases, the process has to start over again. The primase has to come in and build another little piece of primer. And then the DNA polymerase 3 has to enter the scene, find that primer, and then build out its piece of DNA moving in that same direction. And so effectively, what you get is one strand being constructed in a way that is continuous, and the other strand being constructed in these little discontinuous fragments. The discontinuous fragments are called Okazaki fragments, named after a pair of Japanese scientists who uh, first discovered them. And the two separate strands of DNA have different names based in the fact that one of them is being replicated much smoother and much faster than the other one, while this one lags behind because it has to be made in fragments due to its directionality. The strand that is replicated continuously is referred to as the leading strand, while the strand that is replicated in fragments is called the lagging strand. And those names make sense when you think about the nature of how the two strands are replicated. This strand leads the other one because it goes smoother and faster. This strand lags behind it. Okay, so once this process finishes, and, and this, this chromosome can be a very long chromosome, so this process will go on for a long time. But once this helicase makes it all the way through the chromosome, we still have additional steps that need to be completed because as you can see, the DNA is not just DNA, but rather interspersed with little pieces of RNA here. And so another enzyme acts after DNA polymerase 3 does its job, and that enzyme is called DNA polymerase 1. DNA polymerase 1 is responsible for cutting the RNA primers out and replacing them with DNA. Because remember that the goal is to make two new strands of DNA, not to make strands of DNA that are interspersed with RNA here. So the DNA polymerase 1 will enter the scene, find the RNA primers, and remove them, and then build out little pieces of DNA molecules in their place. So at this point, our molecule looks like this. We're still not completely done here. Because as you can see, there are these little gaps in the backbone of the molecule that represents the new lagging strand here. And so the very last step in preparing these DNA molecules is for a final enzyme called ligase to enter and repair these little nicks in the backbone of the new DNA between the Okazaki fragments. So ligase will enter. It will repair 
the phosphodiester bonds that are missing between those different fragments. And then finally, you have what look like two pretty continuous intact molecules of DNA. So we just walked through those different steps in the process piecewise, uh, and I did my best to animate them as we went through, but I also want you guys to see them in the form of a video where they all lead into each other in one nice smooth continuation. So we're going to take a second and cut to that video and then we'll come back to the lecture. The replication of DNA begins at a sequence of nucleotides called the origin of replication. Helicase unwinds the double-stranded DNA helix and single-strand binding proteins react with the single-stranded regions of the DNA and stabilize it. DNA polymerase 3 is the major enzyme involved in DNA replication. DNA polymerase 3 can only add a nucleotide to the 3' prime end of a pre-existing chain of nucleotides and it cannot initiate a nucleotide chain. Therefore, an RNA polymerase, called a primase, constructs an RNA primer, a sequence of about 10 nucleotides, complementary to the parent DNA. DNA polymerase 3 can then add deoxyribonucleotides to synthesize the new complementary strand of DNA. Because the two parent strands of DNA are antiparallel, they are oriented in opposite directions and must therefore be elongated by different mechanisms. The leading strand elongates toward the replication fork by adding nucleotides continuously to its growing three prime end. In contrast, the lagging strand, which elongates away from the replication fork, is synthesized discontinuously as a series of short segments called Okazaki fragments. When the DNA polymerase 3 reaches the RNA primer on the lagging strand, it is replaced by DNA polymerase 1, which removes the RNA and replaces it with DNA. DNA ligase then attaches and forms phosphodiester bonds. The DNA is further unwound, new primers are made, and DNA polymerase 3 jumps ahead to begin synthesizing another Okazaki fragment. For simplicity, DNA polymerase 3 has been depicted as separate units, one acting on the leading strand and the other acting on the lagging strand. The current view of DNA polymerase 3 is that the two subunits function together with the DNA on the lagging strand, folding to allow the dimeric DNA polymerase molecule to replicate both strands of the parental DNA duplex simultaneously. Proteins other than DNA polymerase 3 are not shown. So hopefully that video was helpful for you seeing the big picture of the process. One final concept that we want to discuss in relation to DNA replication is that the process is both elegant and efficient in that it is semi-conservative. The word conserve means to save or preserve. Water conservation, for example, means to save water. And so semi-conservative refers to the fact that every new double-stranded piece of DNA that a cell passes on to a daughter cell is made of two strands, one of which is actually the old DNA, and the other of which is the new DNA that was made based upon the sequence of the template in the old strand. Therefore, it is semi-conservative. We're going to finish this lecture off with just a few checkpoints to test your knowledge. In this one, tell me what would happen to a cell that had a dysfunctional version of the enzyme helicase. Similarly, in this one, tell me what would happen to a cell that had a dysfunctional version of the enzyme DNA polymerase 1. And then last but not least, explain to me in your own words why one of the DNA strands is replicated continuously while the other one is replicated in fragments.